Okay, welcome back after break. Uh, just before we went for our break, we were uh, studying chapter uh, five. We were looking at fleshly led sacrifices versus spirit led um, sacrifices. Okay, so we said that, you know, how do we know if it's spirit led sacrifice? How do we know if it's fleshly led sacrifice? Is by looking at the fruit. Okay. If through your life, what you are doing, whether it's ministry, whether it's in the workplace, if people's lives are being ministered to, people's lives are being transformed, you know, the gospel is being reached. I'm talking in the context of ministry. Gospel is being reached to many people. You know, many people are receiving Christ. Many people are convicted of their sins. They're growing in their life. They're growing in their walk with God. They're growing in their prayer walk, in reading the word of God. Then we know that it is bearing fruit. Okay. Versus uh, fleshly led this one, there is no uh, fruit that there will be a little fruit, but it will not be fruit that is long lasting. Also, we know that if it's a spirit-led sacrifice, then, you know, it will stand the test of time, okay? Look at what Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, Precious stone, wood, a or straw, straw, each, straw. Each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. So what is the test between fleshly led sacrifices and spirit led sacrifice? To stand the test of time. Okay. If it's led by the Holy Spirit, whatever challenges, whatever difficulties, whatever problems, you know, God's work will continue. The project will continue. Like we see the Bible, many people have come and, you know, have uh, tried to destroy the Bible, but we still have the Bibles in our hand, right? Um, like when uh, Tyndale printed uh, 6,000 copies, William Tyndale uh, printed 6,000 copies of the Bible, the Bishop of England was so angry because William Tyndale wanted the Bible to be in the hands of all the common people so that they can read the Bible and know what the church the practices that were happening in the church was not according to the Bible. You know what the bishop did? The bishop took those, bought those 6,000 Bibles. Okay, he bought 6,000 Bibles and he burned all those 6,000 Bibles. But you know what God did through that? He had to pay money to buy the 6,000 Bibles, right? That 6,000 Bibles, the money that the bishop paid, that money came to William Tyndale because he's the one who published those Bibles. And you know what he did with that money? He used that money to pay off all the debts that he had because of printing the Bibles that he printed and also gave him the money to, make, to improvise on his translation. So I'm saying how God can use situations and people, even when they try to do harm, God can use it for the good. So he was able to pay off his debts and he could use the rest of the money to do what? To improvise on the translation and he was able to print more Bibles. Okay, So we see that that was not a fleshly led sacrifice. That was something was spirit led because it stood the test of time. Right? Many people try to destroy the church but the church still stands. It's the work of God, right? So many organizations have started. Many have closed down. Maybe it's because of their own flesh or what we don't know. We can't uh, judge them. But many still stand today as a testimony of what God has began in them. Okay. So we need to understand what kind of sacrifices we are making. The price God asks us to make uh, can be different for different 
people. So because God is asking somebody else to pay that price doesn't mean you also have to pay the price. Because somebody God is asking somebody to leave their job and come into full-time ministry doesn't mean you do the same. If God is calling you, please do it. If not, continue with your job or what God has called you to do and God can use you there. Okay. So that was chapter um, uh, five for us. Any questions? Any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, we'll move on. Now, Shani, did you understand what it means to carry the cross? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, the last thing is finishing your course. Okay, we have not yet finished our course. We have two more books to go. It's just finishing one book. But it's talking about finishing the course for life. Okay, uh, it's not just good to begin. Okay, it's imp Im uh, important to begin well, but also it's important to finish well. Okay, uh, it's not just important to have your goals, but it's also important to finish your goals. Okay, look at what Luke chapter 14 verse 27 to 35 says. Can somebody read that please? And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me can't be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build the tower, does not sit down first and count the cost whether he had enough to finish it? Least after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000 or else while while the other is still a great way off he sends a delegation and asks conditions of peace so likewise whoever of you does not forsake all that he has can't be my disciple salt is good but if the salt has lost its flavor how shall it be seasoned it is neither fit for the land nor nor for the dung hill, but men threw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. So Jesus is teaching us here that we must count the cost when beginning our journey. Okay. Think about uh, what it will take to become what God has called you. Don't rush blindly into it. Okay. For example, if you feel in your heart that God has called you to be a you know, a, a doctor, or an engineer, a businessman, whatever, you know, uh, God can use you to do that well, okay? But you have to go through that preparation. You have to count the cost. You have to learn what it takes to become a businessman, okay? It's not just enough to declare that, hey, God told me, to do this or God told me to do that okay and uh, you know just go off and start whatever God is asking you to do whether to start a church you know become a pastor a businessman whatever uh, if you do that you will be doing things very very carelessly and things can fall apart in a few months but if you have discovered your purpose you know, you have to be prepared to do what God is calling you to do. If you're not prepared, you risk the task, you risk, you know, completely losing out on the course or, you know, you starting it and then leaving it half finished. So how can you finish your course successfully? Okay. The first thing is planning. Okay. So some Christians misunderstand Jesus' teaching in Matthew when he says, do not worry about tomorrow, but let tomorrow worry about itself. So they take this verse and they understand it as something that they should not plan for the future. Okay, But planning and worrying is not the same. Okay, Planning and worrying is not the same. Same. What Jesus is telling us here is not that we should not plan. What is he telling us here? He's telling us don't worry about tomorrow. 
That does not mean that we don't plan for tomorrow. So planning involves thinking through when, how, where, what, you know, answering all of these questions. If you look at the Bible, the Bible also encourages us to plan. Okay, look at what Proverbs chapter 4 verse 26 says. Can somebody read Proverbs 4 26? Ponder the path of your feet and let all your work ways be established. Yes, ponder means think deeply. Think honestly about the direction that you are going. Can somebody else read Proverbs 6, 6 to 8? Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her supplies in the summer and gather her food in the harvest. So here it says the ant has no external guidance, but what does the ant do? It plans about the future. What is it planning? It knows in winter it cannot store up food. It knows winter is coming. So it's planning ahead of time. So God is telling us, hey, go look at the ant, small as it is, you know, but consider its ways and be wise. No one to oversee it, no one to give it external guidance, but look at the wisdom. It's planning for the future. Proverbs 14, 8 and 15. Can somebody read that, please? Yes, you can go ahead and read. Somebody else. The mic is not working. Who else has the mic? The wisdom of the pro prudent is to understand his way, but the folly of the, the fool, folly the of folly the of fools. The fool is deceit. The simple believers every, every word, but the prudent considers well his steps. Yes, so here the prudent person does what? Carefully evaluates the road or their path they are taking. And they're asking themselves this question, where is this path leading me to? Is this path leading me to fulfill God's purpose for my life? And if it is a yes, then they go on that path. If the answer is no, they wisely choose another path. Okay, look at what Proverbs chapter 22 verse 3 says. Proverbs 22.3 A prudent man forces evil and hides himself, but the simple pass, pass on and uh, punished. Punish A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. So he says the prudent, who is a prudent person? a wise, sensible, cautious, practical person. A prudent person has foresight. That means they are able to see the dangers ahead and they are able to take the precautions. Okay, And the Bible gives us clear instructions in many places to look ahead and to plan about the future. Okay, So how can you effectively plan for your future? future. The first one is write it down. Sit down, write down your plans and pray over it. You know, once you sit down, write your plan. Next five years, say, God, next five years, I want to finish studying in Bible college. I want to do this. I want to get married. I want to go here. I want to start this church. I want to start this organization. Write down your plans and then go to God and say, God, this is what I sense that I should do. These are the steps I think I need to take, okay? But I want to make sure that my will, my plan is aligned to your will and your plan. So I'm submitting it to you. God, take it. Feel free to change it. Make the changes, whatever, and I'm willing to accommodate those changes. The second thing is to, to uh, effectively plan is to expect the unexpected, Expect the unexpected. Be prepared for heavenly interruptions. Be prepared for unexpected changes. Sometimes God's plans differ from ours, and we need to be flexible, and we need to adjust to God's timing and 
plans. Okay. And then, of course, we need to plan according to the spirit and not according to the flesh. Okay. Look at what Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 15 to 17. Can somebody write, uh, read 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 15 to 17, and please? And in this confidence, I, I intended to come. Slowly, to the... slowly, please, and loudly and clearly. Thank you. And in this confidence, I intended to come to you before that you might have a second benefit to pass by way of. Way Are you of reading the... 2 Corinthians chapter. This month. 1 verses 15 to 17. Okay, can you just read verse 17, please? Therefore, when I was planning this, did I do to lightly or the things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh that with me there should be S, S, and no, no. So Paul is planning to visit the church at Corinth. And so he's saying, hey, when I was planning to visit you, do I, did I do it lightly? The things I plan, do I plan according to the flesh, you know? So Paul's answer is implied. That means it's very, very uh, implicit here, very, very clear here, very, very, um, it's, it's just meant, okay, that, hey, I don't plan according to the flesh, but I plan according to the spirit, okay? So we see that when, when Paul was going in a second missionary journey, there were different places that he had planned to go, but the Holy Spirit led him to a different route and he went to the places that the Holy Spirit led him to. Okay. So, you know, he says, I plan according to the Spirit and not according to the flesh. Okay. Uh, Jesus also promised in John chapter uh, 16, verse 13. Can somebody read John chapter 16, verse 13, please? It's not there in your textbook. Can somebody read that? However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. Here it says, the Holy Spirit shows us things ahead to come. The Holy Spirit gives us foresight. He helps us in planning what lies ahead. Okay. The verse that Jesus says, don't worry about um, uh, tomorrow is. Um, in Matthew, uh, I'll look it up and tell you. Okay. Matthew 6.34. Matthew 6.34. Thank you. Your name. Okay, so um, even as, you know, we plan and prepare, we need to balance the spiritual and the practical, okay? Now, God has given us a mind. He's given us brains. And why did he give us a mind and a brain? Why did he give us a mind and a brain? To use it, to plan, use it to plan, okay? So when the Holy Spirit reveals things to us, it's our responsibility to use the wisdom to execute the plan of God. The Holy Spirit is not going to do everything for us. God is not going to do everything for us. We have to use the wisdom to execute the plan. Now, God does not get offended when we use our intellect, Okay, when we use our mind, he wants us to use our minds. He wants us to use our uh, uh, intellect. Okay, as long as we keep our thoughts and our actions sanctified, God can use it. So we need to have a balance between the spiritual and the practical. Okay, we need to make sure that our mind, our thoughts is aligned to God's ways and his will and his plans as well. Okay, so... I'm just going to wrap this up uh, with, uh, you know, discussing the importance of running to the finish line. Now, the one of the most important things is to complete the course with endurance. Okay. To fulfill the purpose for your life, you need to keep going even when the journey gets 
tough. Even when the journey gets difficult, you need to have endurance. You have to endure, have to have the endurance to finish. So how can you keep going when the going gets tough? Look at what Hebrews chapter 12 verses 1 to 2 says. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witness, witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily uh, en entangles, us. entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Yes. So at times, you and I might not feel excited about the call of God. You know, there are times when you're, uh, when the calling might seem joyful, uh, but, you know, you have to do the calling to, and you have to fulfill that calling. So you're, you're, sometimes you might not feel joyful, but you should not let your feelings hinder you from pursuing God's call. You need to have endurance to finish the course that is set before you. So how do you run with endurance? How can you run to ensure that you finish the race? Paul is saying, what is Paul saying? What are the things that you need to do? The first thing, lay aside every weight. Lay aside everything that is pulling you down. Second thing, Lay aside the sin that so easily entangles you. Your sin that easily catches you, doesn't allow you to fulfill God's plan and purpose. What is the third thing you need to do? Run with endurance. And the fourth one, looking up to Jesus. Not looking at your battles, not looking at your giants, not looking at your difficulties, but looking unto Jesus. Okay? Now, uh, we look at Paul as an example. Look at what Paul says in Acts chapter 20, verses 22 to 24. And, and see, now I go bound in the spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me, but none of these things move me, not do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may, I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to gospel of the grace of God. Yes, sometimes we need to lay down our lives to finish the course that God has set for us. That lay down means what? We need to just give up everything, just press in endure to do what God has called you. Okay. Look at what Paul further declares in Acts chapter 21 verse 13. Can somebody read that please? Then Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be born, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Yes. So here Paul is uh, going to Jerusalem. And there is already received warning from many people not to go because he's going to be bound and he's going to die in Jerusalem. So all the believers are sad. They pray, you know, they're crying. But, you know, see what Paul is willing to go to Jerusalem. Why? Because he knows he has to finish what God has called him to do. Okay. And then we need to finish the race, not only with endurance, but finish it with faith. Look at what Paul's final words, his last letter that he writes to Timothy, who he is left in Ephesus in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 to 8. Can somebody read that, please? For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my de departure. Departure, departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept of faith. Finally, there is a laid up, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteousness judge, the righteous will, judge, the righteous judge will give to me on that day, and not to me, 
only but also to all who have loved his appearing amen so paul is saying his life was been poured out as what poured out as what as a drink offering right as an offering to god on the altar and his words remind us of his ultimate goal what was his ultimate goal to fight the good fight to finish the race and to keep the faith and was paul able to do it yes with whose strength with god's strength and the strength of the holy spirit and we see that even as paul went about enduring and running his race with faith we are also called to do the same thing we are also called to strive we have also called to be people who finish the race that god has set before us amen okay any question uh, shani you had a question yeah um it was in hebrews 12 verse 1 i never knew what this what this means but it says therefore we also since we have since we are surrounded by such a great a cloud of witnesses what does that mean does that mean that people who have died in our family are looking down at us what does that exactly mean Yes. So here, therefore, uh, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, that means he's saying we have to endure and run our race. Uh, you know, uh, because there are so many who have gone ahead of us, so many who have lived our lives, Bible characters, so many missionaries who have lived our lives, who are a great witness. And you know, even as they have endured, they have run the race. We too have to uh, endure. Look at their lives, learn from their lives. Just they, as they are endured and they run their race in faith, we too will have to endure and run our race in faith and finish the race that God has called us and do what God call, has called us to do. Yes. Did that help? Yes. Thank you. Okay. Any questions on these lessons? So we finished, yes. How do you know if the, the opportunity is from God? Okay, good question. Um, you will hear the inner voice of the Holy Spirit. You will get a confirmation from the Bible. Uh, God confirms it through his word. You can... Uh, when somebody is praying over you for prophetically, they can confirm it. A council of people, you know, his word, the inner witness of the Holy Spirit, all of these can be confirmations that God is opening this door, this circumstance. He wants you to do this. <clears throat> and there's inner assurance of peace. Um, there is that stirring, there's confidence for you to go on, take it up. That also is there, yes. Please speak in the mic so that I took that opportunity and uh, if I took that opportunity and but after taking that opportunity I'm going through um, certain things goals and challenges Struggles and challenges that okay. that challenges made me depressed mm -hmm. and it uh, like it those uh, challenges like hitting my mental health and emotion health so what then what does that mean what does that mean so that means that um, you know um, that does not mean it's not from god it means that you are not just being rooted in god it does not mean that when you follow life's god's li uh, plan and purpose is devoid of uh, problems and difficulties and trials and persecutions all that will be there but what you need to do is you need to always be connected with God, just like Jesus. Jesus faced a lot of difficulties, faced a lot of persecutions, a lot of struggles, trials. But why was Jesus able to overcome all of that and still die on the cross, still take on the sins of the whole world? Because he had was so intimate with the Father. He would spend the night praying, spend the night speaking to his Father, and doing what his fathers asked him to do. So he drew strength from there, even though he was fully man. So when Jesus required the strength of the father, how much more you and me should depend on the 
father right so that is important for us whatever we are doing in life it's very important for you to be grounded in god's word and in the uh, in prayer otherwise in fellowship in worship otherwise anyone in any situation can give up on life because of all of these um, emotional and mental turmoil that we can go through okay so there was this uh, incident happened that there was this lady who having workload and he was working in a ministry she was working in a ministry so she had a workload of like so much that she was not having mental health good mental health and uh, people were also saying you have to do it it's like that it is workload is more but you have to do it it's like that it's okay this we also did but after a month or so she died because of that workload because of that depression and anxiety of attacks so then what does that mean what does like, that mean like she have like people have to work keep working off because like if they are working then i think that is foolishness and yeah. god has given us a brain to use because god cannot override our will and our choices but god has given us you know our bodies are the temple of the living god and we need, we are responsible to take care of our bodies there are some things that god cannot do for us like taking on responsibility of looking after our own bodies eating right sleeping right exercising knowing when to stop knowing when i cannot do anything more okay god will not override our choices he's given us a will given us brains we need to use it if you know that our job is kind of pulling us down is giving us mental health and trauma and all of that we need to stop right we need to take a break we need to take care of our health and give up that job even maybe for some time just take care of your health and then look for another job so god cannot be held accountable god cannot do that for us there are some things that we need to do for ourselves which god has asked us to do we are we are responsible for our bodies we take care of our bodies yes so it's like god gave us some opportunity but uh, that opportunity if that opportunity like um, like become some kind of a burden in our life and it's affecting our life to other people who are in that who are in that field so we can leave that thing is that if god okay? gives you an opportunity you need to be at the right place the right time doing the right thing also god can give you an opportunity to be a pastor but you have to be the right place the right time doing the right thing the place that he the door he opens not what you feel like so god is saying be a, go back and be a pastor in your village but you say hey i want to be a pastor at apc and you are having a hard time here and everything is going wrong you can't blame god saying god you wanted me to be a pastor but god is saying i want to be a pastor in your village you have to be at the right time to receive god's promotion protection provision but ma'am it's like if i'm asking for a job suppose i'm asking for a job to jesus and uh, i got a job but in that job they, the people are very like torturing me giving me work loads and giving not giving yeah me. that's what we learned right in that chapter when we saying that god takes us to the preparation process the foundation is hard work it's not easy everyone goes through hard work bosses are not easy they are tough okay it comes to an extent where it's getting on your health and you are at the point of a breakdown and all that you have to take a decision for yourself but everywhere the work load is not easy it's not an easy ride for everyone and in every job place every work that god assigns for us is hard work hard foundation work where you have to work you have to build you have to give in it's long hours and you have to put in that yes even at apc yeah <laughs> even at apc yes it's not easy <laughs> yeah yeah i hope i helped you yes shani you have a question Yeah, I yeah, well, I had, I had originally one question, but just kind of just piggyback on what he was saying. Um, so I know you're saying that there'll be difficulties, but I guess what he was getting at, and I'm trying to make sure I understand, when it comes to the point that it's giving you mental turmoil. Sorry, I'm not able to hear you and understand you this time. Can you please increase your volume so I can hear you clearly? Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I'm trying to. Yes. Can you hear me now? 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Can okay. you be a little more articulate, please, so I can and slow, so I can understand you? Thank you. Okay. So I had originally one question, but I have two now because I'm just piggyback on um, the gentleman's question because I know he was saying like if you having I know you're saying that that you will have difficulties, but I'm just trying to understand that if it's come to a point where it's mental turmoil, then you know that it's not really from God. I mean, I guess that's what I guess that's what he was trying to acts and that's kind of like that's the way i interpret it like how do you really know like if it's mental turmoil is not from god and you leave or is it just because you say you will face difficulties and then the second question that i had was something a, a question about um this uh, recognize the stirring um within and i just have a question can you because i always the way i interpret it from what the way you explain is that your will and purpose for your life, I always assumed it was associated with your job, which you do for a living. But I took some notes and it kind of seems like, is it, is it not? Can your will and purpose not be your job? Can it be separate from your job? Oh, I, I couldn't get your second question, but I think your first question was aligned with what, um, Prem had asked, and um, uh, sorry, I'm a little unwell. So, uh, so your your first question was, um, can anyone help me? Uh, if, they, if somebody gets an opportunity, it takes a toll on their mental health. Uh, can we say that it is they're not in the right place and they're not doing what God is asking them to do? And hence, they're going through um, all of this mental torture and things like that. Uh, it could be, uh, I'm not saying no, but also it could be that, uh, you know, um, uh, it could also be that, Maybe, um, it is, uh, like a hindrance that people are putting in your life to stop you from fulfilling God's purpose and plan, or maybe God has something great in store for you. And this can be something like a hindrance. So maybe you can, uh, you know, you can pray about it, think about it. And then yes, take a break. And then if you want to come back and then tell them that, hey, this is this is getting out of hand for me. I can't put in so many work hours. I feel I'm overstressed. Uh, or you can take a call of just leaving it and going to another place where you can do a similar assignment and ask God to open doors. All that, I think all it depends on just waiting on the Holy Spirit, asking the Holy Spirit uh, to lead and to uh, guide you. Yes. So that was your first part of the question. Sorry, the second part we did you hear? Yeah, yeah I can repeat it. Sorry. Do you do you want me to repeat it? Yes, please. So the second question that I have, because I took some notes about um, recognizing the stirring within, and I'm just kind of I'm a little bit confused on that. Um, There's a question that I had about two lectures ago, but I always thought that your purpose and your will for your life that God has for you is like your job and your career, which you do. Can it be, can you have a job and a career and then your purpose and your will be separate from it? Oh, no. I've always, I always assume that, you know, if it's your purpose in life to be a doctor, you'll be a doctor. But then I thought that you saying, where God can um, start the um, recognizing the stirring within that it kind of I kind of thought it could be separate. You can have a career and be a doctor, but that cannot be your purpose in real life. It could be something different. That's what I'm trying to get an understanding. Okay, I got you. Yeah. So um, no, it's not the, your plan and purpose is uh, you know is the job that God is giving you. Your calling, your studies, the courses that He's taking you to, the job that you finally get into, the vocation that you are in, uh, is uh, is God's plan and purpose for your life. And then He can use uh, 
uh, the sphere that he has put you in, one of the seven mountains. It can be whether it's education, religion, family, media, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, government, um, you know, all of these spheres of influence or mind molders, as some people say, or seven mountains where you, God can also use you to release his kingdom reign, his kingdom presence, his kingdom rule, and, you know, to uh, influence people with the gospel, uh, to share the gospel with people so even if you are a doctor you can be you know doing god's plan and purpose you can um you know you can minister healing not only just through uh, the tests and the medicines but also you can pray for patients that come for you you can minister supernatural healing uh, you can share the, the love of jesus with them you can share the gospel with them you can ask them to pray and trust and put their faith in uh, jesus so you can whatever gift of uh, volition job that god has called you to yes god can can use you there to release his plan and purpose for your life and that is also part of his plan and purpose for your life did that help uh, yeah i guess i'm a little bit confused because i took some notes and you had said uh, when the section about recognizing the stirring in you said ask yourself what really excites you you need to ask yourself these questions then you will know what god is stirring in your heart we are yes. not talking about your job or what you do at work. We are talking about what God is stirring up in your life that may be different from your work slash job. That's what I took notes from which that you said during the um, during that session of recognize the stirring. And that's when I got kind of confused. Oh, the stirring in your heart. Yeah, that um, was section three, recognizing the stirring within. That goes back to page 15. That was from the notes I took. And that's when I got a little confused. Yes, God can use the stirring in your heart in any job. For example, you're a teacher. Uh, God can stir your heart up uh, to, you know, to minister to a child uh, who God is saying, hey, that child is broken because coming from a broken home or family or the child is having learning disabilities. It's because of there's some mental trauma abuse a child is going through so god can stir your heart up to that child to minister to them or that your god can stir your heart up as a as a teacher uh, to to share the gospel with your children to share the love of god with the children god can stir up your heart to, i've also read where uh, you know teachers were teaching children with uh, special disabilities and uh, this teacher with the special children with special disabilities all the teacher was doing was every morning, we just felt the stirring in our heart to teach the children some scripture passages. So the children were just read, uh, you know, just repeating those scripture passages uh, that teacher was saying. But in the end of that semester, the parents were very amazed to see that their children's learning abilities were improving in a in, in, in a great uh, in a great way so they came back to the school they asked the principal what is the teacher doing our children are imp improving we, we we can see very less of their learning disabilities and when the teacher was called the teacher said all i did was just ask the children to you know speak uh, some scripture passages or bible verses i was just teaching them and that was uh, you know uh, just a move of god and she was just doing it because she had a stirring in her heart uh, to do it so the stirring in our heart can you know god can move us to do anything in any uh, job that he has placed us so if a if you're a doctor and a person comes to you god can stir your heart up to just speak supernaturally into their lives speak supernatural healing and wholeness uh, into their lives even before you administer heal you know uh, physical healing for them yes so it doesn't mean just uh, stirring in your heart when it comes to ministry but you know uh, also in other areas of your life so i think i understand that what you're saying is that in terms of your purpose and your will it is related to your career but i guess i was just confused because i i guess the notes i put that you said ask yourself who you're passionate about ask yourself who you're willing to sacrifice everything for sleep money etc but then it says that because god can stir it up in your heart but it said we are talking about what god is stirring up in your life that may be different from your work or your job and that's what was confusing me and that's what i'm still kind of confused um, about in terms of when you said that that was some lectures back but i was going over it Oh, sometimes God can stir your heart up. Maybe uh, you're a doctor, but to leave your, you know, your good job as a doctor and God is stirring your heart up for some tribal group of people to go and uh, be a missionary doctor. 
that can also be a thing, right? Or you can also be a teacher and God uh, is stirring your heart up for some missionary kids in Africa or some other places of the world where uh, there's a lot of poverty and problems where children are facing. And you want to go as a missionary and just teach. God can stir up your heart for that as well. For like Nehemiah, we use Nehemiah as example. Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king, but God stirred his heart up to, you know, take a break and go and finish rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. But he came back and he became, again, he resumed his position as a cupbearer to the king. Yes. Okay, now I understand. So you may have your job, but then maybe God may stir something else up that's also separate. You do that, you go back to your job. Am, am I kind of understanding it now? Is yes. that what you're saying? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Ma'am? Yes. If a person is in uh, faithful, he is yes. good in spirituality, but uh, in fleshy things, he has done some sins. In the final day, whether his soul, is, his spirit is saved, or both his flesh and spirit, both will be given to the devil's hand. What do you think? When somebody prays a salvation prayer, what do you think? And they continue to do some sins, right? Will they end up in hell or heaven? Yes, why? Because when we receive salvation, our salvation is sealed. Okay, we are children of God, we will be part of heaven. But yes, we can lose our salvation. Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 10 also talks about that. Uh, we can lose it, but what is that extent? It does not tell us when we reach that limit. But yes, we, we are not perfect. We do sin. But what do we have to do? We come back and ask God for forgiveness and we continue. But we know that we don't lose our salvation. Our salvation is sealed forever. We are children of God. Yes. And also there are sins which are forgivable and which are sins not, not forgivable also there now. Two type of sins are there. Now, some sins were be can be forgiven, but some sins could not be forgiven by God. Sin is sin. All sin is forgiven. All sin is condemned. All sin consequences is death. Jesus came and paid the punishment for our sins. Those who believe in him, their sins are all wiped out. Okay, there is no some sins that are forgiven, forgivable, some sins unforgivable. That's nothing like that. All sin is sin, right? And all sins are unforgivable. Unfor but Jesus died on the cross for our sins and forgiveness is through the blood of Jesus and what he has done for us on the cross. And each one has to receive that individually. Even though Jesus died for the whole world, we have to individually receive forgiveness for our sins. Yes. Any other questions? I thought I will start uh, receiving God's guidance, but we'll we'll do that next week. Okay, so um, yes, Shani. Um, I just have a question. Are we still having the assessment yes. for Monday? So I we think are? only two people have responded to that. So I'm just going to go with it. Um, so all of you online students, the assessment will be posted on Monday. Um, uh, you know by 4.30 or 5.30 Indian Standard Time IST and you please return it on October 2nd. It will be two kinds of questions, set of questions. One will be multiple choice. So you'll have a question with multiple choices and you'll have to choose only one for the multiple choice. For the checkbox questions, you will have a question with uh, multiple options. You will have to choose more than one option. Okay, And the other thing is, please read the instructions very carefully. And since this is going to be an open book assessment for all of you, uh, so if you, if you, in the multiple choice, or sorry, in the checks box question, if you get, if there are four right options and you choose three right options and you miss out on one wrong, right option, the whole thing will cons be considered as a wrong answer. So um, if you're saying that is unfair, it's not because um, it's an open book question and uh, you have your book and you have a couple of uh, two days which you can answer your questions and uh, it's a good way to test uh, your uh, learning and also, uh, you know, your understanding. Okay, so that's what we've been doing. And please note that um, 
uh, when you hit the submit button, you can't do anything. I can't help you as well because it's all automated and it all comes. It's just it's, it's just all automated by the computer, so I can't do anything uh, to help. Okay, so that is about your um, assessment. Any questions on that? Yes. Yes, Sabagya. Can I save that uh, assessment and then uh, uh, send it later? Like, uh, sorry. Can I, save, can I save the document and after preparing the uh, after finishing it, uh, can I send you? Yeah, I think so. You can do that. Yes. Yeah. And please note the um, the questions and the options will also be based not just on the notes or not just on the publication. If you look at your publication, there's a lot of things that I have said in class, which is not there in your publication. So it will be also based on the class lectures and not just in the what's there in the publication. So if you've listened and you've taken notes, then it's going to help. Yes, Shani. I just have a question because I'm kind of confused on terms of Indian time and I know I'm in California, United States, and I'm a day behind you. Can we have it due based on the time where we live at? Because I will get less time than somebody in India because I'm behind. Hmm. So can we can I'll we, can check we with the, I'll check with the IT team and then I will post it on the stream page. Is that fine? Yeah, just to see whoever, whatever time period, can we have to do that time period? I mean, that time that we're in, like if you're in the United States. Yes, and I understand. We're, yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank uh, we've you. We've always had, uh, we've all, the last years, we've had students from all around the globe. And I think it's worked perfectly when we just done this. So I think it shouldn't be an, it shouldn't be a problem because we've done this with people with different time zones. Um, so it should not be something too much of a concern, but I will uh, get back from the IT team and I will post it on the stream page. I hope that helps. Yes, thank yeah. you. Okay. Thank you all for joining class. Have a good day and God bless. Uh, yes. Um